My name is Jeffrey Sidoris, and this is Process Driven. You know, trying to make a living as a professional photographer is hard, really hard. You might get into it thinking that all you're going to do is take pictures, but it doesn't take long to realize that time with a camera in your hands is only a small part of what's required day to day. It's even harder when you're also working a full-time job. But Freddie Clark is doing the work. He's taking his passion for photography, an encyclopedic knowledge of beer, and a background in IT to steadily build a new career as a food and beverage photographer. And it all started at a small rock and roll radio station in the Poconos. Here's my conversation with Freddie Clark. Please listen carefully. So how does it feel to be to be back kind of on the mic uh, after after because you're kind of you've kind of gone full circle now, right? I yeah, mean, you, well, you I started in radio. I did. I after after college, I worked in radio for a decade, maybe more. Uh, so it would have been 98 to. Uh, yeah, I worked in radio for a full decade for 10 years. And um, and actually, it's been. Almost 20 years since I left it. Wow. So it's been a while. Um, but it's fun. I'm having a good time with it. It was, um, when I, when I went into it, it was ultimately, it was my passion 100%. Um, you know, in college I would do anything to do an air shift and right out of school. I mean, I would midnight overnights. I used to drive to the Poconos on a Friday night, sleep in my buddy's house, whether they were there or not. They had like a a vacation home and sometimes Mm -hmm. they weren't there in the winter and I would sleep there. So I could get up at four in the morning to go do the morning show at a small rock station in um, in the Poconos Um, and then drive home Saturday morning at like 10 a.m. when I was done. Um, So I loved it. Um, But then some along the way, um, the the way radio is, there's no money. There's um, we used to joke that we were one step below circus clowns (laughs) when you talk about performers. (laughs) Um, so, you know, it kind of over time, you know, the, the necessities of life, the responsibilities of life, right. You know, got to the point where, you know, I, I really need to determine what I'm going to really be doing. What, what um, kind of so, radio were, were you, were you a DJ? Were you spinning whatever you wanted? Were there playlists? Was it uh, more I was a, I was a DJ. I was a DJ and what they call a production director. So my day was really segregated into two parts. During the day, um, I would write commercials, I would produce commercials and sounder sweepers, uh, little things you hear, you know, in between songs, um, you know, usually identifying the station. I would make those. Uh, 107.5. Exactly. Right, right. Or Ex- exactly. Exactly. Yep. All those, um, you know, promos for whatever the station was doing. I'd write and produce a lot of those. And then I was responsible for all the commercial content that was that was on the station. So the um, salespeople would come to me with, you know, all right, we got a new car dealer uh, that we that we signed up for, you know, a, a campaign and they're going to be on X amount of time over the next few months. They need a commercial. So I would write it, work with the work with the uh, the client to get it to be what they wanted and then either record it myself, get another one of the talent to record it, or sometimes, you know, have the client record it. They would come in and do it and then get it on the air and make sure that it was ready for when the on-air talent needed to play it in a commercial break. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a lot of, it was a lot of creativity. It was also, but it was also a lot of, um, what's right, uh, getting it done, right? Project, almost project management in a way. You know, you had Before I left on Friday, I had to make sure I had all the new stuff for the weekend and Monday morning ready to go, you know, and if I didn't do it, I was there all night if I had to be right. So, um, you know, it was creative, but it was also very task oriented. Uh, So that was my first part of my day. And then I would usually take a you know half hour, grab a bite to eat. And then at midnight, uh, seven at seven at night, I would go on the air till midnight. And, uh, you know, you would. The days of back then, at least the days of picking your own music was already gone. Right. Uh, you know, it so wasn't this, the, this was kind of after independent radio moving into corporate radio, like Clear Channel and things like that. Yeah, we were I worked at a, it was a small chain uh, in New Jersey. They had uh, at the time they had two rock stations and 
to AM stations that were more um, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I was I was on the rock state, one of the rock stations down the Jersey Shore. And um, yeah, it was it was pre-programmed. I mean, you know, you could you could mess with it a little bit. Sometimes you would, uh, you know, get take a request. And, you know, I used to mess around more than I probably should have. Um, <laughs> Say it ain't so. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. It's shocking. <laughs> He, he didn't follow the rules all the time. Right. Can't believe right, it. right. 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 Um, but yeah, so it was, you know, it, it was fun. I mean, I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, so when, up what, until a point. What, what year was this? Cause when did, when did freeform radio kind of start to give way to corporate radio? Would that have been late seventies? Yeah, probably the late seventies, late seventies into the eighties. Uh, you started to go through, um, a consolidation, mm -hmm. uh, of, of stations. So bigger, Bigger players would buy up smaller stations around the country. I mean, if you drive around, I used to joke around, you drive around from New York to Florida and you scan the radio dial, and it's still the same today, that you hear three or four different stations. Mm -hmm. They might have different call letters, right. But, right, right, right. The, but the formula is the same. You know, there's there's always an active rock station, there's a classic rock station, there's a country station, there's a dance station, there's a hit station, there's an R&B station. You know, and they can and they feel very cookie cutter. Right. A lot of times that's because it's one big conglomerate, one big uh, parent company. Right. Um, All playing you know. from the same playbook kind right. of thing. Right. Well, and then so when I was there in it would have been in the night, late 80s, early 90s type of scenario, um, those stations were beginning to not just go by the same cookie cutter playbook, but also beginning to do things like record from the same place. Um, have one location where they're doing four or five of those stations, right? So, oh, really? The, yeah. The, so the station wasn't necessarily in, um, you know, in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. It could have been. It could have been in Philadelphia, and they were um, they were tracking. Wow. wow. Doing voice tracking, almost so like a call would, center type thing. Right. So yeah. you would get wow. you. Would, so it was start. That was just starting, um, and that was the writing on the wall for me to say, you know, maybe it's time to really think about doing something else because it was not, um, it was not, I didn't see it as a viable future anymore. Right. Did you have the feeling consciously then that your days were kind of numbered? Well, the, what really got my days numbered was, um, I had a mentor who I had interned with in a station in New York city. And, um, you know, I'd been to college, but just working with this one guy over the course of like three or four months during my internship, I learned so much from him. Um, you know, and I would, after I was working professionally, I would call him and we would stay in touch. Um, and he worked at a real big station in New York. And one day he calls me up and he's like, uh, Freddie, I, I just lost my gig. The, the station's changing formats. Do you have any jobs? Oh, wow. And I'm like, I can't. You're, you're the guy I, I look to for jobs. Yeah, what are you talking I, about? Yeah. What, yeah. Do you, what do you mean? I, you can't work for me. I should be, you know, you want me to quit and you could take my job, you know? So, um, so that was, that was a real defining moment for me. And that's when I really said, you know, I've got to, uh, I've got to find something else to do. So where do you go from there? Cause it's interesting. No, knowing you the way I do, you, you've got, you've got these sort of acts in your life where, you know, act one was, was let's say before radio act two was, was radio. And now you're in act three because act three is where, is where the, the, the story really changes. Right. And, and where photography is starting to take center stage. Well, there was even, I would say there was an act that would be act four okay. and then act three would be. So while I was working in the radio station, it was just at the time where they were going from the analog, you know, cutting tape up and recording mm -hmm. on tape and splicing tape to computers, to digital workstations. So literally, I came into work one day. Um, I walk into the production room and there are stacks of boxes with computers in. Them. And um, we didn't have a full time engineer at that point. And the part-time engineer really didn't know it. He was a he was an old-time guy. He was you know he knew antennas and and signal and you know and and, and tape machines and analog mixing boards. Right. So we kind of looked at oh and the, so the general manager walks in and see I she you know I look at all these boxes and I'm like well what do we do? He's like well that's your that's your new digital audio workstation. I'm like oh okay. Put it together. 
Pretty much, yeah. Put it to, if you <laughs> yeah. want to use it, and you know you should use it. You better figure it out. So I would, I would be there. I remember being on the air, and I would have the manuals and while songs are playing. I'm flipping through the manuals to try to figure out how to put this together tomorrow. You know, so um, it was it was a on the job training in in the burgeoning PC industry, right? There right. was, you know, it was an old Wintel machine and it was an old beige box. And all right, how do I make that work? And then how do I connect it to the analog equipment? What's the interface? How do I connect them together? And then how do I use them? So over the course of uh, the year um, before I left, it was probably about a year, um, I had to be the PC computer guy. Mm-hmm. And, and, and did you see that as a as a new position within radio or still as a, as kind of an interim to something else? Or, or were you conscious of it even? At the time, no, I didn't see it as anything other than trying to figure this stuff out. Mm-hmm. Day um, to day. It, yeah. And yeah. it wasn't until after, um, when I was at, I was at a party, I was like at a friend's party and talking to somebody who worked in the computer industry and, you know, worked in technology and he's talking about all this stuff and I'm hanging with him. And I know what he's talking about and I'm able to participate in a conversation and I get it. How did that feel? I mean, after only having a, a pretty limited, it sounds like a pretty limited experience with that. How did it feel to be sort of toe to toe with these guys who it was their business to be in that business? Well, I mean, it was I, I have always been mostly self-taught. Mm-hmm. You know, I learned throughout my life. I learned, you know, sometimes, the, you know, the, the school of hard knocks, but I've always learned on my own well. Right. So, um, you know, that, that didn't, that didn't, I mean, yeah, I was fine with that. What's, I guess in hindsight, I was lucky enough that it was still a new enough industry. I don't know Mm -hmm. if you could have done that today. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cause now it's, the industry is so much more, um, that, you know, it's so more, so much more complex. I don't know if I could have done that today, but at the time it was still new enough. It was ground floor enough that, that I was able to pick it up on my own. It felt good. You know, I like knowing shit. (laughs) (laughs) Or at least thinking you do. (laughs) Right. 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 Or at least being delusional enough to think that I know it. So where did, where did the transition to, to, I mean, I know we're, we're, we're going to kind of pack a lot in here, but where did the transition from computers to finance to photography come in and was 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 beer there all along because there's a, there's a fascinating sort of arc that's that's happened with with your your love of beer and your love of photography but I want to kind of sort out where that came from and what came first okay so I'll just I'll I'll, I'll distill it down so oh, I see what I, you did there I see that <laughs> um I'll ferment it the um my first job in what we'll call technology was, um, at a company called oddly enough, the image bank. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was as a, you know, as a help desk guy, there was a small company and, um, it was, uh, you know, helping out the the staff with their computer problems. So it was a, it was a very entry level job Mm -hmm. and, um, like entry level it, would you call yourself an it guy? Yeah, it was exactly. It was a total, it was a total entry level it guy job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would sit in a, I would sit at my desk and people would call me and say, Hey, I don't know how to do this. And I would walk over to their desk and help them do it and walk back to my desk. That was my day every day for, for about a year. So while I was there, um, people left to go on to other positions and other companies. So little by little, I worked my way up and was exposed to more and more. Mm -hmm. So it was not just that I was, I, I went from help desk guy to running the it department for this little company in like a year. Right. Um, and you know, you learn, it was a great time to do that because you learned a lot of things and you were exposed to a lot of things. So you would get a call one day and, the vice president wants to be able to dial in remotely from his home on the weekend to work. And at the time it was, that was not something that was normally done. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure it out. How do I do this? What do I need to make it happen? Buy it, build it, show them how to use it, get it up and running. And, and that was done. Right. So there was a lot of experiences like that. So I got a lot more, um, a lot more of a broad base 
then a um, couple other jobs, a couple other um, companies, and every time was more of a was more growth, more exposure. Um, before I knew it, I was building out exchange networks, wow. um, you know, so email exchange networks and, and doing all, you know, bigger and bigger projects like that. And, and um, where did you see it going or, or did you see it going anywhere at the time or was it still day by day like it had been previously? Uh, it was still day by day. I never, I, I never had, I always laugh when people ask me, wait, you know, ask me, usually it's a job interview question, right? Where do you see yourself in five right. years? <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell knows? Right. You know, I, I mean, I've never been able to answer that. And oddly enough, every five years, I'm still working and living and, and surviving. So right. it's, you know, right. I never planned that far or it was always, all right, what's the next gig? What's the next job? Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I worked my way through it. And could you see a thread through them, though? I mean, starting with with the computers at, at the uh, at the radio stations, could you see a thread sort of a technology based thread kind of tying all these positions together? It, well, not, not really in the, in the, cause there was a lot of different technologies and I, I wound up doing a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what I would say the thread that in my career became not so much what I knew technically, but what I, how I was able to talk my way through stuff and, and get stuff done. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it became not so much that I was, I was, I'm an all right technician, or in the day I was, I was an okay technical person. I was never knew the most in the room. I was never going to design an operating system. I was never going to be, you know, that, that guru person. Sure. Um, but I, my strength became that I could work with just about anybody and find my way to getting the job done by hook or by crook mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm. Which has you immense know, value in and of itself, those two things. Well, well right? yeah, and that's yeah. and ultimately that's where what my current career is really about. You know, I am as a project I'm sorry, as a product manager, um my job is not technical. I joke around now that, you know, if I'm the one pressing the buttons and moving the bits around, you've got much bigger problems. <laughs> um, you've, you've, you've called the wrong person. Right, right. You are in, you went down the wrong road big time, buddy. Right, Sorry. Right. Um, but it's now it's more of um, working with people, communicating, bringing all the, all the things together. I, the, the best way to describe what a product manager is, is if you think about a wheel and spokes of a wheel, that center hub with all the spokes going out, I'm that center hub touching all the different aspects of projects te in, in technology right mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. So it's I'm working with the clients. I'm working with the engineers. I'm working with the vendors. I'm working with the finance people. I'm working with – uh, the compliance people. I mean, so it's everybody you're working with as a, as a product manager to get the stuff done. So that's where it trained. My job kind of grew into that. Mm -hmm. So it was not so much, all right, you know, you're going to be in charge of the SQL database team. You're going to be in charge of the rolling out the SQL database product. Sure. To, but you, it sounds like this. you know enough about it to work with them effectively. Like, you know, right. enough about the, the different spokes in the wheel to be able to speak to and be respected by each of the different departments. Right. Yeah. And that's, yeah. no, I know enough, just enough to be slightly dangerous <laughs> and, you know, can, can work yeah. my way through it. Exactly. I'm the same way with code. I, I, I know just about as much as I need to, to most of the time fix what I break. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Yeah. So same type of thing. Right. And, and I have a, and I have a, I have a knack for, uh, you know, I have a knack, I don't want to call it BS cause I'm not bullshitting people, but I have a knack for being able to, uh, get into a room, even if I don't know people. And within a few minutes I can talk to just about anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, I personable, I don't know, maybe that's the right term. I've never thought to define it, but that's always been one of my biggest strengths. And that probably comes from my radio days. You know, I, you know, I would, I would, you know, you'd have to be, you, I'd walk into a bar in the middle of New Jersey and have to get up on stage and, and convince a bunch of, you know, drunks that, you know, I've got t-shirts to give them and they should be excited about that. You know, so it was they're under really fire. great t-shirts. <laughs> right, right. They're fantastic t-shirts, you know, come up and do something silly to get a t-shirt and, right. you know. You know, so that's kind of where I guess, yeah, that's where that came but yeah, out. It of. sounds like you you were able to make them comfortable enough to do it in the same way that you're making these various teams comfortable enough to trust that you're the guy that should be at the hub. 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't, if you don't gain everybody's trust, it becomes all that much harder. Mm-hmm. You know, if they think you're, if they, if they think you don't know what you're doing, it becomes that much more difficult, if not impossible. Right. It sounds like everything's roses, right? So, so where, where did the need to, to be, and I've got my air quotes, creative in a different way come in? And, and when did it become so important that you knew that you had to do it for more than just a hobby? Okay. So that being said about my career, my career, Mm -hmm. I don't find in my definition of creative, I don't find that creative, right? I don't find the problem solving and, and the, the communication that's not creative to you in the way that you define. Okay. Right. That's, that was not creative. And And when did you realize that from the beginning or did you evolve to that? kind of conclusion? Uh, probably from the beginning, because having been working in radio and writing commercials and doing the on-air stuff, and that I thought was, that was a creative outlet. That mm-hmm. was also my career at the time. So the photography um, grew more out of the fact of um, when my daughter was born, um, I wanted to, I wanted to do pictures and, and video of her, right? So um it really came out of, I bought a camera cause you know, kids coming, gotta, you know, gotta have a camera, right? Sure. Sure. So, um, opening the box of the camera and realizing there was no real good instructions. What, <laughs> how, you know, what the hell do you do with this thing? You know, what, what's this, what's this, there's an M on his dial, there's an A, there's an S, what does any of that even mean? Right. Um, so again, learning on my own, I would start to dig into things, dig into books, you know, stop by the bookstore at the time, you know, learning on my own how to work another piece of technology, right? Initially. Um, and did it, did it grab you in the same way that radio did, even though it was a different discipline? Not at the time, hmm. not initially. Um, it was initially, it was definitely a means to an end to document my daughter's life. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I got into video doing that as well. That led for a little while. I did wedding videos on the side. I would shoot and Which edit is, wedding it's videos. Fascinating. That stills aren't difficult enough to learn from ground zero. You've got to dive in to video as well. Well, yeah, yeah. I, well, and that's it's well, I you know because I started and look, I never. For me, I don't look at anything as impossible. Mm-hmm. It's just how do you figure it out? How do I figure it out? How do I look at this and get this done? Um, So it's not that I didn't think of it as a daunting challenge. I'm like people videotape all the time. How challenging can this be? Hmm. Now, I'm not saying it from I'm not saying it from an artistic perspective. Sure. sure. I'm just saying it from the nuts and bolts perspective of doing it. You you looked at it almost, it sounds like anyway, uh, almost programmatically. Right. Right. Interesting. Definitely. Interesting. So um, so I then uh, did that for a while, did the wedding videos um, and that was, that was interesting. That was fun. I also, I had a lot of experience in the wedding industry as well from college days, mm-hmm. being in, being a DJ, I also DJed weddings and stuff. So it kind of, you know, I was already experienced in the area. Um, while I was doing those, I, you know, you'd sit around in between like, you know, while everybody's having dinner and you sit down with the photographer and the DJs. And as the video guy, I'm asking the photographer questions about the still photography because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at the time for me, the the artistic part of video, videotaping weddings, there was it was, you know, it was I was there to do a job for somebody and make sure I captured everything. But I, I thought still photography was fascinating. It was more so than video. Yeah, it was some something about it was more mystical, uh, more of a. um an unknown, hmm. um, you know, like, like, all right, so just something as, as simple as bokeh, right? Um, from a video perspective, you don't worry about that. Most in, at the time, you know, I, you know, you're doing a very specific type of job. So it's not like, um, you know, I'm not Martin Scorsese here. I'm filming a <laughs> wedding, making sure I'm getting everything. <laughs> right. Um, you've got but, pretty much a shot list. I would imagine that you work from and go, okay, I've got to get this. I got to get this. I got to get this. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it can be very cookie cutter mm-hmm. as you go. But for some reason, the, the still photography, looking at the photographers and how they approached it and seeing the photography, I'm like, wow, that's a lot more creative in my mind at the time than what I'm seeing 
on the video side. Hmm. So I started going into, um, you know, trying to, you know, pick their mind a little bit to see what they were doing and what that all meant. Um, so that was like that, that, that was in, you know, for a few years, probably very, um, I don't know, very tertiary exploration, not digging into it, but interested, fascinated, and kind of, you know, learning a little bit at a time. And, and were photographers at that time, were you able to discern, Hey, these guys are seeing something different than I'm seeing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And there were like one or two who were very good. And, you know, I remember the first time I saw a shot of a, it was, you know, like a dance floor shot, bride and groom. And I didn't even realize that he had done this, but you know, low angle shooting up at them across a room with a lot of depth of field. Um, you know, the, the parents on both sides and it was a wide encompassing shot, but you could get the emotion of it. Hmm. Um, you know, you could see the parents, uh, you know, crying during a dance or, you know, see, um, moments like the, the bride's dance with her father and you see the, they're both a little teary, but happy. And I'm looking at that going, wow, I just captured a dance. This guy captured emotion, hmm. you know? So what was he, were you, were you able to look at it and, and figure out like, what was he or she seeing that I'm not? And, and is it, is it because I'm not seeing it or is it because I'm using the wrong medium? Were you able to discern? At, at the time I felt it was cause I was using the wrong medium. Mm-hmm. I, I, I thought video was a documentarian device, a mm-hmm. documentary you know, a method, um, where, you could and 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 wrongly so i think if i had at the time if i had applied it more if i had thought more about video i probably could have done more with it um but for some reason I, there was a schism in my head that it was possible to do this with with photography it was not possible to do this with videography wow. so it was so it became where and again another segmentation where okay video was helping me pay bills but photography was more of an artistic endeavor um, that I could that I could be creative with. Mm-hmm. How lo- how what was the gap? How long was it before you really started to take it seriously and started to pursue learning more about photography actively rather than just talking in between kind of gigs at weddings? Well, it was a major life event that did that. Um, so at about hmm, shortly thereafter couple of years after, um, I, uh, went through a divorce mm-hmm. and, um, I remember, you know, I was a little messed up and, um, talking to my therapist one day, um, and trying to work through everything. And he looked at me and he goes, all right, well, you know, we'd gotten through a lot of the nuts and bolts of what had happened. And I guess he was trying to rebuild up my psyche. And, um, he said to me, um, all right, Freddie, what do you like to do? And Jeffrey, I remember staring at this guy and I, I just, I was blank. Nothing. Like I was like, I don't know what to tell you. Wow. And he's like, well, what do you mean? I don't know. I said, I, I've been for years, a, you know, working both in technology and weddings on the side. I'd been a husband and I'd been a father, mm-hmm. but for the better part of, I don't know, 10 years, maybe, no, probably since I about when I left radio, nothing I had done at the time or in that time period rather was for me. It was always for someone else or for providing, Hmm. um, you know, paying a mortgage, getting the money to buy the new car, all those types of things. Fair to say that that's maybe the first time as an adult you had ever heard that question. Oh, what what, what do you want? Yeah. What do you like to do? What do you want to do? Um, so I, I just stared at him and, um, he said, well, let's, we'll, uh, let's table that, go home and think about it and let's talk about it when you come in. And that was, that was like earth shattering for me because I remember going home, you know, and, you know, going at the time, going to my little apartment and, uh, trying to and looking at those basically blank walls because it had all been new. I just moved out type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and really having a, a crisis of identity right. and what am I, who am I? You right, know, right. Um, well, I used to, how did your parents approach their careers? Did, were they of the mind that 
basically, you know, the adage of uh, if, if you were supposed to like it, they wouldn't call it work or did, did they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. It, if you know, if it if it if it was if it was supposed to be fun, it wouldn't be called work. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That was exactly the you know, and, and I and I think, you know, I think that's how they approached it. And to my knowledge, you know, that that was it. That's it. work was work. And that's what you did. You work, you retire, you get a watch then you go to Florida. Right. Right. And hopefully you don't drop dead 10 minutes after you get the watch. Right. So, um, Interesting. So, yeah. so, so you had was, never had those conversations with your parents about, well, gosh, Freddie, what do you want to do after school? What do you want to do when you, th- that was completely foreign to you. It sounds like. Well, no, no, it was, it was not foreign. It, going into radio was very much what I wanted to do. Okay. That was my, that was a choice. I, Right. That was my choice. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do this. Um, and damn the torpedoes, I was going to do it. I mean, mm-hmm. no matter who told me this is a bad idea, it's a career that could end up a dead end. You know, only there's very few Howard Stern, Don right. Imuses, and Scott Shannons. Most of them are in obscurity making crap money. And so, how did your, how did your folks care. react when you, when you f- first went into radio? Were they supportive? Uh, not well, marginally. So uh, real quick aside, my in, in high school, there was talk of me going to a military academy uh, like to are you don't laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did, did that, was that out loud? <laughs> right. That came out of nowhere, didn't it? <laughs> so I was going to go to either West Point, uh, Annapolis Air Force Academy. Wow. Um, and to the point, well, my father had some, my father had some, uh, military background reserves and that type of thing. Uh, he knew, uh, our local Congress person. Um, so it was, I, my grades were good. I was always a good student in high school. Um, and I could get, I could get the congressional appointment to basically whichever one I wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and I Which was had thinking, to make your father immensely proud. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. immensely proud. Yes. Um, but when I went and looked at them, saw how these people were treated, uh, how, how they were treating freshmen and being having a chip on my um, on my shoulder. I'm like, these pe- these these guys are not going to yell at me because they're a year older than me and treat me like crap and make huh. me eat last and, you know, make my life miserable for a year. You know, when you're in high school, a year is eternity. Right. Yeah, sure. So sure. a semester. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I said I came home. It was after the trip to um, it was after the trip to uh, Air Force Academy out in Colorado. Mm-hmm. I got off the plane. My father had picked m- m- my mother and up. I I got in the car and I said, "There is no way in hell I'm going to be in the military." Really? And how did that the go car? Over? The car like jerked <laughs> forward as he hit the brakes. <laughs> Um, you know, and, um, and this was, this was back in the day where there were no seatbelts. So you just, right, right. so I bounced, right. I bounced off the windshield and he, he kept pumping the gas and pumping the brakes. So I repeatedly bounced like a off Jerry the Lewis movie. Yeah. So, um, so, so that was a big shock. And then to turn around a year or two later and say, I'm going to go to college for communications. I want to work in radio. Let's just say it was not the big popular decision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 the it's yeah. the, the the crane shot from the movie of your father on his knees going why right, back, right, belly up at the sky, yeah, and it's yeah, just yeah. Like, the rain falling <laughs> the down. Scene yeah, in Shawshank, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, it had been years though since that decision, mm-hmm. and um, had you made any decisions for you in the interim? Do you think, uh, or, or between- was was everything really geared toward have to provide, have to provide, have to provide? have to provide in my, yeah. and, it, and it's not like there was any, at that point, there wasn't really any external push on that, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, all I, self-imposed I, probably, yeah, pretty yeah. much a lot of that totally self-imposed. Mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. married. I had a child, you know, there's things you do. Um, you know, we've had this discussion where there's things you do as a yep. man and you have to do that. Yep. Um, so that was, you know, that was my mindset. And, um, so when I'm, I'm, when I went back to, um, my therapist, I didn't really have any great answers for him yet. And, and so we're, we're kind of, we're kind of, you know, uh, working it and talking it through. And, um, he had, he was a bit of a photographer and he had some pictures he had taken up on his walls. And I said, well, I do like, you know, I, I do like photography. I've had, you know, I told him a story about the videography and the interest there. Um, so he's like, well, go buy a camera and just, you know, just do it. 
So I was like, all right, that sounds like a good idea. So I went out and bought a camera and really then worked on um, how to make it work and how to make it do what I wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was, you know, that was a progression. And I did then I did weddings. um, I did wedding. I shot weddings for a while. Um, you know, I do, I went, I went looking, right. What, what's the most interesting thing for photography for me mm-hmm. uh, in photography for me? W- was it different? W- was it as different as you had thought or maybe even hoped it would be to shoot stills at a wedding versus video? Did you have a different experience? Yes, much different because mm-hmm. I was, I had a different mindset and also in, in I, I thought it more, I thought of it more creative. I thought it was a more creative platform. Um, and also at a wedding, a lot of times the photographer is the the conductor mm-hmm. of the event, right? So once you get out of church, the photographer basically runs the show yeah. and brings you through the rest of the day, yeah. right? So you're, you're um, back in, in some way, you're back to that hub position, aren't you? Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but you're also, it was a creative endeavor. I, in my mind, it was more creative and that's the way I approached it. So I tried to be more creative with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, weddings become, I give, I give amazing credit to people who can do them every weekend in, you know, weekend in, weekend out, you know, they're, they're exhausting. Yeah. They're long days and it's a lot of editing after the fact. Um, and, and so I, it, I think you have to love weddings to be good at it. I mean, I, yeah. the wedding photographers who I know that are, that are very good wedding photographers, they genuinely love weddings. Yeah, they yeah. are genuinely happy for the couple, for the families, for they love them. And it shows in the photographs. Yep. And and it's probably not um, it probably wasn't coincidental that av- having recently been divorced <laughs> was not my best <laughs> was, idea. To go blue shoot period. Weddings. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so it probably wasn't a great time for me to be shooting weddings. Right. Um, but, but it just wasn't, you're like, you're it like wasn't the Adam Sandler of wedding photographers, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Drunk and, you know, <laughs> yeah, just, you, before you, you're going to be divorced before you get this picture <laughs> back, <laughs> which oddly enough did happen. I, a couple before I was able to, before they got their proofs, they were divorced. But oh, no. anyway. Um, so, uh, and I just went and looked at different things then, you know, different type, different types of photography, uh, street photography, portraits, you know, all, you know, landscape. I just started to do everything. Try to working your way through looking for your thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then my thing kind of came, um, two pronged. It was, um, my cousin owns, uh, some restaurants on Staten Island Mm -hmm. and said, Hey, you know, you knew I was taking pictures. You want to do some pictures for me? So I said, you know, of the food and the restaurant, I'm like, all right, yeah, that's great. And, and I went and I loved it. Um, straight away. It was straight away. It was, yeah. it was fun. It was interesting. It was, um, it was, um, I could, I could, I could, I don't want to say, I mean, I could conduct it. I could, uh, orchestrate the environment. I mm-hmm. could, you know, did, you know, dress it up and, and implement it how I wanted to. Um, and it was a little bit more, um, it was a little bit more, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, for myself, it was more of a mental exercise to get everything together, hmm. right? So it wasn't like – it wasn't a collaborative experience where I'm working with a model, but it's like – it's almost like a problem. It's like, all right, right, how do I make this look good? How do I make this look appetizing? How do I include the ambiance but while still highlighting the food, right? So how you know how do I bring it together or push it apart to expand – uh, to expand the table or, or compress it down. So it's, so it's more of an intimate feeling. Um, you know, it became something that, you know, I could, I could work with and maneuver and at my own pace, um, which was totally unlike a wedding, right. Which is gun, 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 gun. Yeah. Um, but it was something I could do at my own pace and my own speed. Um, so that's, that's where I got into the food aspect. And it sounds like you were conscious of, of a pretty dramatic difference between including, people as subjects and, and not including people as subjects. There was a dramatic difference in how you were able to work with the camera and work with your subject matter when you, when you took people out of the equation. Is that fair? Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I felt like I could slow it down. Um, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, it wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't on anybody else's time. Um, you know, even when I do portraits, I always kind of feel like I'm, I'm borrowing their time. Um, 
and I want to be as um, economical as uh, efficient with that time as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and and wedding is the same thing, you know. Like you always, you, like I had twenty minutes to get portraits between, um, you know, appetizers and and main course. So sure, let's sure. make the let's make the most. And you've of this. got a responsibility to hit that mark. Exactly. Yeah. But but this was not that at all. This mm -hmm. was I you know I could you know I, yeah you know if there's hot lights you got to worry about the food wilting and whatnot you know sure. lettuce. But you can there are fixes for that. And you can do a lot of prep beforehand, and then when you get, you know, when you get your hero in, you can shoot it, and you know, you 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 were able to. It was my time, is what it was. Mm -hmm. It's was totally my time on my, um, my schedule. And did you feel like you were, you were progressing, in, in terms of artistic and technical knowledge? Did you did you feel like you were progressing at a, at a more steady or even clip than you were with weddings because you were so under the gun, you couldn't really focus on, on, I've never progressed quick enough for my liking mm. in anything. Right. Mm. So, um, I've always been driven to the point where I want to get, I want to get this down. I want to figure this out as quickly as I can. Um, and I would try to do that and look at other things and look at other, look at other photographers and, and look at magazines and look at billboards and, you know, and try to absorb as much as I could, you know, but what would happen and initially, and I, I'm a lousy cook. I'll be the per first person to, you know, I can I can make a hamburger, I can barbecue <laughs> on a grill, and you know, that's about it. Anything with fire, you're okay. <laughs> right, right, right. But you know, mix ingredients. What 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 is this? What's a what's a measuring what what measuring cup is this? I don't you know. Yeah. Well, um, what spice so, do you use, Freddie? Salt. Right, right. <laughs> well, yeah, salt and maybe some pepper and is beer a spice? I yeah. don't know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So um, so that part of it, I always felt like I was. I could never make a dish mm -hmm. to photograph on my own. And and that was stupid at the time. I should have just bought a cookbook and, right. and fought my way through it. But um, it sounds like you you started to see that as a limitation of subject matter because you can't you can't always, you know, go to your cousin and go, hey, you know, right. make me a bunch of this so I can shoot it. Exactly. Right, so right. And there weren't a lot, in the, especially in the beginning, there's not a lot of opportunities. You know, mm -hmm. nobody's hiring you. You're you're not getting restaurants knocking at the door. Right. So, you know, it, it's a slower progression. And were you working with a stylist at any at any point or is this all you're you're, you're sticking to your ability to self self start, self motivate and see it through? Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. And fi figure it out and, and, you know, full steam ahead. Mm hmm. Um. Yeah. So that's, and the funny thing is that's what then ultimately the, because of those gaps of material that led me to beer because there's, I did, I can go to the store and buy beer uh, bottles. That's right. easy. Right. right. And, and it was, so it was, I was always big into, I always liked beer. Um, that's a, you know, that sounds stupid to say. I always like beer. <laughs> For those of um, you listening, Freddie doesn't just like beer. <laughs> it's an obsession. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie likes beer more than anybody I've ever met. And I know some beer drinkers. So, yeah. So, um, but you yeah. know, it's funny. That's a, that's another, that's another n knowledge base that you pull from. And, and you and I have had a bunch of conversations about what makes one better than another or what are the characteristics. So it's not, it's not that you, that you just are a consumer. Y you really are an aficionado of, of what makes these beers different and special. And I think one of the things that I've, really enjoyed about watching you progress on this is you're able to highlight those things in your photographs. You're able to, to sort of capture a mood of a particular beer and they change based on, on what the product is. And mm -hmm. so yeah. you, you, you can tell that you, that you love the subject matter that you're not just going through the motions and going, well, okay, I've got to use this kind of lighting and I've, oh, well, I want it to look, you know, uh, uh, misty. So I've got to use glycerin and I've got to, th those are tools, but they're not the impetus behind the photograph. You, you right. really do love this, this subject matter and, and want to show it no pun in its best light. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. That's, that's a good way to put it. It was, um, you know, they would, it was at the time and initially it was, they were in the refrigerator and I had time and I needed a, a subject. I'm like, Oh, well, this will be cool. Um, but see, initially going back though, years ago, I was a, you know, a swill beer drinker growing up in like college and everything. I drank, you know, whatever was available. Right. So, um, what's the worst that, beer you've ever, you've ever had? 
well, like Rainier see. or Grain Belt or something like something. Probably, just... probably, uh, I would, I would, it's a, probably a tie between Schlitz <laughs> and Strohs. Because that and that's what was that was around when I was growing up. Right. You know, it, it was not the craft beer thing was not a, a a thing then. Right. And imports were, you know, we're not we're not snooty people. We're not highfalutin people. We don't have imports in the house. We Heineken. Had, uh, Heineken. What, what are we? we the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it was, you know, there was a case of Strohs. Right. Always a case of Strohs in the basement, and it was. I, and sometimes I wonder if it was always that one case. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was always a case of throws in the basement. Um, and then I remember I remember going when we were in college. When I was in college, uh, I was up at SUNY Geneseo for my first year of college. And the Genesee factory was literally, you know, you could throw a, a rock and, and almost hit it. So we would go there and it was like it was like you'd bring back the last case of empties. And I swear to God, for like five bucks, you'd get a whole nother case, you know, and it was like, all right, well, I guess this is what we'll drink. And it was now I've tried it and I'm like, oh, my God, this is horrid, you know. Right. Um, but, yeah, so I was that kind of beer drinker for years. Um, and it was only um, it was actually a road trip that I did with a buddy of mine to Boston. And we went to uh, the Harpoon Factory and um you know, they take you around and then they gave us 15 minutes at the uh, what the, at that at their tap room. And as part of the tour, you know, price of admission for the tour, you got 15 minutes to try the beers they had. And they had a lineup of eight, eight drafts and you could drink as much as you want and work your way up and down the row. And I was like, wow, what is this? Oh, this is an IPA. I never I didn't know what an IPA was mm -hmm. like. It's really good. I like that a lot. What's this? So this is like a wheat beer. All right. Not really my thing but okay that's cool and you know right right down the line um and that's where i was like wow this is i didn't realize there were all those tastes that were available there was um, just beer up to that it point. was beer right yeah, it was yeah. it was beer and it was you know domestic and import that was the segregation <laughs> um you want roll white or red <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so it was that's i was like wow there's a lot of different tastes here uh there's a lot of different um, textures and, and mouthfeel and, you know, and every beer is not the same. So that started that discovery of, you know, well, all right, what's available, what's out there. And it was, you know, I was, so Jersey beers probably weren't as big yet, but you know, there were the dogfish heads and the Sierra Nevadas. They, those were around and, and you could find better beer mm -hmm. without looking too hard. So mm -hmm. it started the path of, Trying different things. What do I like? What do I don't like? But at the same time, even if I don't like it, well, what is what is it? What's its characteristics? Why don't I like it? You know, what's different about this one than that one? Then this one I love, that one I hate. What's what are the differences? So that progressed the 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 tasting, the uh, the enjoyment of it. You do seem to approach them differently. There's not a a, a set way you approach everything. And it does seem to have to do with the character of the beer itself. Is that conscious? Not so much. Sometimes the character of the beer, like the a beer will say certain things to me. Um, they, they talk to me, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> so I, hear. <laughs> I can hear their voices. They're calling me right now. I must go. Drink um, me, Freddy. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, certain things mean different things. Certain beers will mean different things. Um, sometimes it's what haven't I done yet. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that in my head for with photography in general is I hate repeating myself, um, and and I hate, and I, you know I, I don't like to do the same thing if possible. And mm -hmm. and I've gone through periods of time in different aspects of photography where I'm like. I'm doing the same thing. I'm taking the same shot over and over again. This is boring the shit out of me. I got to move on to something else. Right, right. And it sounds like it doesn't take very long for you to get to that point. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Like, you know, sometimes it's as much, I, I've done that shot. I know how to make that work. If somebody wants to pay me to do that shot, I know I can do that again. Mm -hmm. I've done it, you know, check that box. It's, right. in the, it's, in the, it's in the portfolio, ready to go. What is next? What can I do next? Um... So a lot of times it's that, like, how can I light it different? Like I, I've gone through, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were asking me about how do you backlight the beer, like the, a bottle or a glass. And I'm like, well, I've, I've messed around with three or four, five different ways to backlight it. I've done reflectors 
bouncing the light through it. I've shot back back uh, through a translucent um, translucent backdrop through the beer, uh, through the translucent backdrop into the beer. I've shot right behind the beer into it. I've bought an ice light and and wedged that behind the bottle to try to get you know. Um, I've light painted with a flashlight, so it's I'm still trying to find. You know, I guess the search for my style, but mm-hmm. I'm still trying to – and I, maybe I never will. Maybe they'll always be, all right, if I do it this way here, I'll get this out of it. If I do it this way, another way, I'll get a different look. But I'm always trying to find different ways to approach it, and that's the photographer. That's not the beer lover. That's me trying to just do different things as a photographer. Mm-hmm. So it's not always the beer – talking to me sometimes it's the photograph talking to me so there's many voices in my head (laughs) (laughs) got your therapist on speed down here (laughs) oh i i've worn a couple out (laughs) it it's it's interesting that that there is this distinction and and it, it sounds like just like you know with with building the the daws and and you know doing it that there there is this technical root, even at this creative pursuit, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a grounding almost in the technical side of it that doesn't necessarily drive, but certainly informs the creative side. Yeah. I am a, I'm a believer that there is, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm a believer that it's when, (laughs) well, (laughs) that's true. True. All right. The hell with it. I am a believer that you need to really know the tools Mm -hmm. to be artistic with the tools. Um, at least for myself, Mm I am, I, I am not the type of, I'm not the type of person who's going to go out with a camera blind and just start shooting and, and not figure stuff out. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, it's, there's, there's a progression of, you know, you, you have a toolbox. If you learn how to use all the different tools in that toolbox, then you can go build a house. But if you just, somebody throws a toolbox at you and says, go build the house. If you don't know how to use the tools, you're not going to be able to build the house. Um, there is happen. There is, there is luck sometimes in photography. Sure. Happy accidents, uh, happy accidents. Yeah. yeah. But if somebody, look, if, if somebody wants, if, if somebody's going to hire me to say, I want you to take a picture like what you did in this photograph that you did in your portfolio, I want to be able to know that, I know how to get there again, mm-hmm. right? Um, that it wasn't a happy accident, or if it was, I was able then to tear it apart and figure out what I did and then repeat it. So in my mind, it's you need to have at least some technical ability and knowledge to be able to build on. I mean, with lighting, with with glass, I remember the first time I did it, it's like, holy crap, this the light's bouncing everywhere. I can't, I can't control it. It this is a mess. How do people do this? Well, you can figure out how they do it and get it so that, okay, I know th- for this shot, I want a, I want a line of light. No, now for this shot, I want a light to be spread and diffused and gradually drop off as it goes around the glass. So you need to have some basis of knowledge to be able to make it do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. What, what's more satisfying for you at this point, getting, getting the tech right or getting the aesthetics right? Are you able to separate them? Um, no, it's, it's getting the aesthetics right now. It's making it look the way I want it to look. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm more happy with the final product, the the image than I am with the process of getting it there. I want it to look the way I want it to look at the end. And, um, you know, that's when I'm the, when I can, when I can get there, that's when I'm the happiest. What's been the biggest challenge consistently that you, that you feel like you haven't quite gotten a handle on yet or is there anything do you feel like you're 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 you're, it's it's the the basics are covered and and now it's a matter of nuance no there's still fights um trying to get a bottle shot done clean in camera is kind of going to be my you know kind of going to be my white whale i think yeah because it's so an average shot i'm probably coming at a at a bottle even if it's just a simple bottle i'm coming at it at least with four lights, right? Mm -hmm. So there'll be a backlight, side lights, and something in the front to kick into the, uh, kick into the label, right? Um, usually that one in the front that kicks a little bit of light into the label is the real nemesis because that's where, that's the light that you will see specular highlights 
around the front of the glass. Mm -hmm. Um, and some, sometimes they're little pinpoints sometimes. And I swear to God, there's, there's elves in my garage where I shoot (laughs) that move stuff around and, and just change the physics of life in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so getting a, I would love someday and maybe I'll never get there, but where I'm able to position everything and work it so that click it and not have to bring it into Photoshop, right? Where I don't even have to, you know, even if it's a little bit, it drives me nuts to have to paint out a, paint out one of those little specular highlights, one of those little Mm -hmm. highlights. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's the part where, you know, hitting that and also finding the right mixtures, the right, um, balance between back sides, front, um, the right glow of, of, of the beer in the bottle or in the glass, um, finding those, those perfect, perfecting those too. Mm-hmm. Is have, probably, have you nailed it yet? Have, is, is there a shot in your portfolio? And, and if there is, don't tell me which one, but is, is there a shot in your portfolio where you went, if I could just do that consistently or more consistently, I'd be happy. Um, for the, for the lighting effect of yes. it? Yes. The, yes. For the actual, like those little speck pain in the butt? No, <laughs> but there's, there's a lot, there's one shot that I, I recently did that. I'm like, all right, you know what? I think I nailed that light on that bottle coming through the bottle. I think I nailed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not giving there's, up Photoshop anytime soon though. No, no. And I would love to, but I, I, I would love, you know, then I, I, you know, I get mad at myself. I'm like, yeah, what did it take you 10 minutes in Photoshop? Just cut it out, you know, and just do the best you can. But then there's the, you know, that little, that little guy under my other shoulder who's like, you got to figure out how to nail this. Right. When did, when did the idea of, of going, and and again, all this stuff is, is such a fascinating progression. You're, you're shooting these things. You, you've, you've said how much you enjoy just you and the product, but at some point, you wanted to get back on the mic and 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 bring someone else into the mix, but rotate someone else into the mix and talk about it. Why did that come about? How did it come about? Yeah, I so I've gone back and forth uh, to radio once or twice, mm-hmm. and I've done um, you know weekends and shifts, you know weekend uh, weekend day or shifts, and um, and as much as there was always a part of me that wanted to do it, there was also another part of me that I'd be like, oh, it's a beautiful Saturday. And I'm making 50 bucks, you know, playing Stone Temple Pilots. Right. And I'm like, uh, you know, so I, that never lasted very long. I mean, it was always I'd love to do it, but there was always, you know, other things and was not to be. Um, and then when as I, you know, started to listen to more and more podcasts, um, I heard a podcast about beer and I'm like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Um, this is poorly produced. This guy just these guys just ramble. Um, this show could have been 20 minutes rather than an hour. Um, they don't know anything about production. They don't know anything about engaging in a conversation with someone. Uh, they don't know how to interview. It's put together terribly. I could do better than this. And then about a minute and a half later, I said, yes, you could do better than this. Put <laughs> that your other money little where voice. Your, <laughs> yeah. Put your money where your mouth is, jackass, and <laughs> do it. You know? So, uh, yeah, the little voice could be a real nasty son of a bitch sometimes. You, <laughs> Sounds you know, like it. Sounds yeah. like it. I mean, you think I'm rough on other people? I'm <laughs> really rough. On, that voice is really rough on me. Um, so, yeah, I was like, so do it. And it was just um, that quick that, that you made the decision. Yeah. I mean, cause oh, I, yeah. Because I remember you, you calling me and going, well, you know, here's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And, it, and it really did seem to be from, from zero to a hundred that quickly. Oh yeah. I, Jeffrey, I downloaded the episode that I was referencing. I drove to work listening to it and probably <laughs> just before seething. I got, yeah, right. <laughs> just road raging, you know, um, by the time I got to the work parking lot and had run over three old ladies, I was <laughs> determined I was going to do this. Yes. So it was that quick. Yeah. It, it, look, there's a, I think it was a management class I took once. They, you know, it was, you know, figure out what you're going to do and do it. Don't hem and haw about it. Oh Don't God. be on the fence about it. I, I and do it. Wish I, I know it's, a, like, it's like I'm speaking French to you right now. <laughs> really I know. <laughs> Have I told you about my notebook thing? <laughs> yes. Yes. So it's yes. It's so it's very much do it and get it and, and you know. But it sounds or, like know, that's been out. a through line your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know, it's, it's a, it's a, let's put this in motion and we can recalibrate. We can, we can, you know, uh, tack one way or another if we're off course, but, but we can't go anywhere unless the boat's moving. Exactly. Exactly. And which is so foreign to me sometimes. Well, I mean, and look, I, I, to me, I know the podcast needs work. I, there are things I want to fix about it, but if I don't do it and keep moving, Mm-hmm. there's no opportunity to fix it. Right. It's not going to um, fix itself. Right. Right. Yeah. It, or I won't know um, how, what's bad about it until I go through, I was, I was talking to a, a guy who was a photographer and we were talking about, um, you know, approaching different aspects of photography. And I'm like, look, you can look at a picture and a, a landscape and say, I could make that picture. Okay. Well, go make the picture. Right. And I guarantee you it's not going to be – that first landscape shot is not going to be Ansel Adams quality. Right, right. But until you take that first picture, as bad as it may be, you don't know what you're capable of. Right. And then You don't know what you don't know. Right. And yeah. that allows you to learn and move forward with it. My first – you know, the first beer shot I did in my living room, you know, no one will ever see that because it's terrible. But I didn't know how bad it was until I did it. Right. Looked at it. And then and at the time I'm like, hey, I did it. Look how great that is. And then, you know, a couple of days later, I'm like, oh, that really looks like crap. And, right. But why? Why does it look like crap? Let's figure out from there. Sometimes you got to get through that, you know, that initial um, infatuation with it, with a with a piece of work, with a podcast, with a photograph. Yeah. You know, at first, you're, you know, you're a proud papa. And then you take step, take a step back and really look at it for what it is and <laughs> say, wow, this, this kid's an ugly little <laughs> bastard, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I will say, and I, I said this earlier, it has been a pleasure to, to watch the progression and to watch and, and talk to you and see how, how seriously you take getting better. It's, it's not, it's not a weekend thing. I mean, you're, you're, you're out there shooting you're watching other people shoot, you're doing workshops, you're, you're, you know, watching tutorials, you're talking to people, you are putting in the time and doing these sort of postmortems afterward to figure out what did and what didn't work so that the next time you approach it, there can be, the needle can move. It may not move for the better, but the needle will move. I really honestly believe that when you stop learning, you stop growing, you stop living. Um, learning is – it should be an, a nonstop endeavor and and that's the key to everything, right? I mean if, if you're closed-minded, if you think I know everything, I've done the best picture I'm ever going to take, I've done the best podcast I'm ever going to do – then you're, you're done, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're done. I mean, it's whether it's, whether it's in business, personal life, you know, like companies who don't reinvent themselves and, you know, Apple could have stopped at the iPod and, and think, Hey, we got this great product. Everybody loves it. Everybody's buying it. We, 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 we hit, we hit a home run done. They didn't, they, they created the next product specifically designed to kill that first product, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? The iPhone basically was, we're going to kill our best selling product with this. Right. Always keep pushing forward. You know, that's so to sometimes come back, it's exhausting but, to, yeah. to come back kind of full circle. Are you are you able to now answer that question that you couldn't answer years ago of, of where where is Freddie Clark five years from now? Can you see that far or is it still day by day? No, it's still day by day. And, and I, every time look, every time I've every time I've thought I had a plan fate came down and, and gave me a kick and said, no, you are completely mistaken, sir. <laughs> you know, so, it, it, you know, to say in five years from now, uh, they, look, I have, I've, there's daydreams, of course, there's five years from now, I'd love to be the, the premier beer photographer and traveling around the country, doing the podcast, taking shots of beers for advertising campaigns. That'd be fantastic. But that may not happen. I can move toward that. You know, mm-hmm. I can push myself forward, but you don't, I always want to keep moving forward. I'm just never sure what road I'm going to be on. That's probably the best way to describe it. As long as I'm moving forward, the road will take care of itself. The the, the destination that I get to will, will be, there'll be a destination. I just can't say whether I'm going north, south, east, or west. But I'm moving forward. 
If you'd like to see some of Freddie's mouthwatering food and beverage photography, head over to santephoto.com. That's S-A-N-T-E photo.com. And if you're up for a conversation about beer, check out Freddie's podcast, appropriately titled Over Beers. And you can find him on Instagram or Twitter at Sante Photo. Subscribe to Process Driven on Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. And you can connect with me on Instagram or Twitter at Jeffrey Sidoris. Uh, you can also pick up a copy of my book, Photography by the Letter, either as a paperback or a downloadable ebook at photographybytheletter.com. And I've got a brand new podcast called Iterations. You can listen to the first episode at jeffreysedoris.com or search for Iterations in your favorite podcast app. And thank you for listening. Thanks for being here. I hope you're enjoying these, and I will talk to you on the next one.